to the police station. Um, I was locked in a cell for quite a long time and then eventually questioned and interviewed. Yeah. And during the interview, they asked me specifically, was I praying? And at that point, I let them know I, I actually was praying in my head. Freedom of thought should be absolute. What we think, you know, obviously we have to maybe discern what to say and when to say it. And that is a question of discernment. But what we think, um, that that should be absolute. There should be no censorship on what we think. People of different religious beliefs, people of no religious belief, and people who maybe support or don't support the pro-life cause. Um, and these are people I've you know, never had any interaction with before, who've just sent you know, emails, messages, you know, text messages. Um, which is you know, incredibly kind for people to take that time. One of the things that does particularly concern me is at the moment um, there is a discussion to bring in national buffer zones wow. in this country. So I do think that the power of prayer is, is very important. It's important we follow that up with yeah. the offer of help if that's something that's wanted. Mm. Um, but at that particular occasion, I was praying outside the abortion centre when it was closed. And I do feel it's important to kind of... Um, mark that place with our prayer. I mean, you, you often notice, you know, maybe when um, somebody dies, if, if it's, you know, maybe a, a road accident, you'll see flowers put at the side of the road. If someone had an accident, you know, halfway up a mountain where nobody's going to see, people will climb there to go and put flowers mm. and mark that spot in some way. So welcome to Shekinah Europe. Here I am at St. George's Roman Catholic Church in Worcester. And I'm joined by Isabel Vaughan Spruce, uh, Director for March for Life UK. And so uh, Isabel, so early, I believe it's in December, uh, you were praying silently um, in Birmingham before you were approached by police. Um, so like, what, what exactly happened? Yeah, it's probably best for me to maybe go back a little bit and give a little bit of background to it. So, I mean, I've been going outside abortion centres and praying and offering help there for, for many years now, probably getting on for 20 years. And the last 10 years of that would be um, as part of 40 Days for Life, which you know some people might be familiar with as an international campaign to help mm. offer alternatives to women outside abortion centres. Um, so that was about you know 10 years ago we started that. And in September this year, the council in Birmingham brought in what's called a PSPO. So that's a public space protection order. And formerly those orders would have been used for things like, you know, um, drunk behaviour, you know, disorderly behaviour, you know, dog fouling, um, things that are, you know, generally regarded as antisocial. Um, but they've actually started to be used around abortion centres to create these zones in which certain types of behaviour are prohibited. And it's important to note that it's, it's behaviour that's prohibited, not mm. people, because some people think it's like a restraining order that stops a person yeah. or a particular type of person or a person with a particular belief going into that area. And that's not the case. Um, it's just certain behaviour that's prohibited. And one of the behaviours that's prohibited around the abortion centre in Birmingham, where I was, um, is protesting. And it names as protesting um, some types of, of prayer or counselling. Mm. So when I went outside the abortion centre, um, it was actually closed at the time and I was silently praying in my head and some police officers came and asked if I was protesting and I made it clear that no, I wasn't. I, I, you know, I was not protesting. They asked if I was praying yeah. um, and I said I might be silently praying, but I wasn't praying out loud at all. And at that point, they then proceeded to arrest me. Um, and they searched me on the streets very thoroughly, you know, confiscated everything out of my pockets, and including my tissues and everything they had with me, um, took me to the police station. Um, I was locked in a cell for quite a long time, and then eventually questioned and interviewed. Yeah. And during the interview, they asked me specifically, was I praying? And at that point, I let them know I, I actually was praying in my head, mm. and they wanted to know what I was praying about. Um, and at the end of that interview, I was released on bail. And then I was um, called back into the police station again and told that I was going to be charged um, for breaking the PSPO wow. um, because of that silent prayer, I presume, you know, yeah. since that was the only activity that I had participated yeah. in in that area since the PSPO had been brought in. It's quite scary that they're comparing, like, 
um, drunken behaviour, dog fouling, to praying. It's, it's really scary, actually, for what it means. Um, yeah, what if, if you could, like, go back in time, or if you this something like this happening in the future, would you approach it differently, or, or do you think you conduct yourself in, like, in a... A good manner. Yeah, a good question. And, and to be honest, I, I have absolutely no regrets over anything I did. I, I think it's absolutely essential that people should be allowed the privacy of their own mind, you know, to, to try and censor thoughts wherever they may be and whatever thoughts we might agree or disagree with. That has to be one of the kind of foundational rights of society, that freedom to think or pray internally however we wish. Um, and so I certainly have no regrets over um, my thoughts, my prayers at, at that time. Um, and that was the only action really that I was engaged in. And <clears throat> what do you think this means for not only the, the country like England's going forward, but generally the world if um, police are arresting someone for, for praying? Well, it's interesting because I have had people all around the world getting in contact with me. And, and what has um, maybe encouraged me particularly is how many people have said, you know, I, I maybe am not pro-life, I support abortion in certain instances, or I, I would call myself pro-choice, but I've still got grave concerns about this, about the censorship, censorship of thought. Um, and I think that should be a concern for anybody. Mm. Um, you know, we all have principles that we hold dear, whether they're religious principles, you know, just principles of belief or um, whatever they might be. And to think that if we're thinking certain things that mm. fall foul of the government or, or, or the police or whoever it might be, that we can suddenly be censored for that mm. is actually quite, quite scary, really. Yeah, for sure, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and how do you think someone can discern whether to speak out about something they believe in, even if it's countercultural? and when to perhaps take a back seat. Do you think there is, there is any moment where people should like take a back seat? Uh, so like, how do you think people should go about um, sort of portraying their beliefs? Yeah, and I think, I think, again, it comes back to that freedom of thought should be absolute. What we think, you know, obviously we have to maybe discern what to say and when to say it, and that is a question of discernment. But what we think, um, that that should be absolute. There should be no censorship on what we think. Um, so I don't think people should be worried about their own thoughts. Um, they should be allowed to think whatever they want. And, and with regard to what we what we say, I suppose that that's always a matter of prudence and that people will be guided by um, maybe their own um, religious beliefs sometimes. That can maybe prompt people to speak or not speak. Um, I know for me, I do think that the, the damage that abortion inflicts on women alone, that, that's enough to make me pro-life. Yeah. Um, clearly, I care about the children's lives who are ended through abortion. But the more I've got involved in pro-life work, the more I've seen how women and men can be deeply affected for many years afterwards. And as I say, sometimes men are the kind of silent yeah. um, victims in this. They're told they don't have a voice in this discussion, that it's nothing to do with them. But I've spoken to many men who've lost their children through abortion, sometimes abortion which they were complicit, sometimes not. I mean, it can affect them, but certainly women. Um, it can take a toll on them, both physically, mentally, mm -hmm. emotionally, spiritually. Um, Organisations like Rachel's Vineyard that work with um, you know, women or men who've been affected by abortion, both directly and indirectly. Mm -hmm. Um, we, I, I work very closely with them um, and, you know, I've spoken to so many women who've, who've been through Rachel's Vineyard Healing Programme um, and have told me firsthand how painful that experience was of having the abortion and the after effects of it. Um, and also they're the ones that say they want people to speak up on this. And that's one of the things that they find most difficult. You know, when I say to them, what would you say to people? The answer is so often to speak up. You know, this this isn't an issue on which we should be silent and which we sh should be censored, because it's it's damaging women. Mm. I think like charities like Rachel's Vineyards and all these pro-life charities are. Uh, it's I think it's incredible what they do. Really, I think the more out there, the better. Really, um, but and so, I, mean, I know you mentioned earlier about you've had lots of like different support uh, from around the world. Um, has all your support just been from people who are mainly pro-life, or is it? Is it, is it really, really varied. Um, 
And, and that's been very encouraging. People of different religious beliefs, people of no religious belief, and people who maybe support or don't support the pro-life cause. Um, and these are people I've you know, never had any interaction with before who've just sent you know, emails, messages, you know, text messages, um, which is you know, incredibly kind for people to take that time. But, but also, as I say, very, very encouraging that we realise um, that the concerns of this, as I say, it's, it's broader than religion, it's broader than pro-life or you know, abortion supporters. Um, this, this is a concern for, for everyone. And actually, one of the things that does particularly concern me is at the moment um, there is a discussion to bring in national buffer zones wow. in this country, which would mean that every abortion facility in the country had a zone similar to the one that you know, um, was around the abortion centre that I was at. Wow. Um, and that's looking like it's, it's quite likely that that could happen, mm. which would be a huge concern. You know, are, are we either going to have mass arrests of people or are people going to be um, totally, you know, restricted on what they can think and where they can think it, mm. what they can pray, where they can pray it, yeah. um, which, like I say, it's, it's religious freedoms, it's, it's freedoms of, of thought and, mm. and obviously freedoms of speech would be censored. So, yeah, there, there is um, very strong concerns I'd have in that area too. So, yeah, there's quite, so there's lots of potential concerns and obviously the thing itself was, wasn't very, it was a very horrible experience, I'm sure, but do you think that any good has come out of this? I know you mentioned about support from not just people from pro-life, but as a whole, what, what good do you think has, has come out of, of this? I mean, one of the things I think it is important to raise awareness of what is happening here with whether it's... Um, PSPOs, like brought in by the local councils or by national buffer zones. Mm. I mean, I've worked in the pro-life movement for, for, for years, as I say, for nearly 20 years. And I work closely with many people who organise vigils outside abortion centres. Mm. I've yet to encounter any antisocial behaviour and I've yet to see any evidence of any antisocial behaviour. Um, and I know in, in 2018, a review was conducted nationally um, and it wasn't considered necessary to bring in yeah. buffer zones just a few years ago. Um, so I, I do have real concerns that um, these, whether it's like, as I say, local or national yeah. buffer zones are being brought in at all. And so I think it is important that this is highlighted. Yeah. Um, but also just the, the topic of abortion it is sometimes one that people feel they can't talk about, it's yeah. polarised. And it is important that we are able to have a civilised discussion on this, no matter what we think about. Mm. Um, so that's maybe a sort of byproduct of this, although uh, you know, what happened to me wasn't directly to do with abortion, it was just to do with freedom of thought. Mm. I do think that people should be able to talk about abortion and should be able to offer help to women and alternatives to women who are considering abortion. And also mm. when they're coming out of the abortion centre, there should be also um, that option for them to, to um, find out where there's healing available, yeah. um, if that's something that they want to pursue as well. So I think it is very important that those options are there for the women who do want it, mm. um, and that they aren't prevented from seeking that help. Absolutely. And, um, and, and as you mentioned, these, these buffer zones outside these abortion clinics, and you, <clears throat> you're praying silently outside an abortion clinic. Um, why, what significance does it have praying outside an abortion clinic? What, like, what significance does proximity have? And, and would you encourage others to, obviously, and yeah, would you encourage others to do the same? Yes, I mean, obviously, um, usually before the PSPO, I would have been um, outside an abortion centre when there was women coming in and out. And I know I've had many women who I know over the years have come out and said, you know, um, I've decided to continue my pregnancy just because I felt the power of your prayer. Mm. Um, these are people that I haven't interacted with, haven't offered a leaflet to. At that stage, they haven't even been offered alternatives. And yet mm. they've just felt that power of prayer has moved them. Um, so I do think that the power of prayer is, is very important. Mm. It's important we follow that up with yeah. the offer of help if that's something that's wanted. Mm. Um, but at that particular occasion, I was praying outside the abortion centre when it was closed. And I do feel it's important to kind of um, mark that place with our prayer. I mean, you, you often notice, you know, maybe when um, somebody dies, if, if it's, you know, maybe a road accident, you'll see flowers put at the side of the road. If someone had an accident, you know, halfway up a mountain where nobody's going to see, people will climb there to go and put flowers mm. and mark that spot in some way. So even people who maybe don't have any faith would recognise that marking a spot um, can be a very significance to us. We're visual people and mm. we like to mark things. 
um, I mark something with my prayer because I'm a Christian. Mm. Um, so that would be my way of marking that spot where um, so many lives are ended through abortion, so many women are hurt. I do feel it's important to kind of saturate that place um, with my prayer. And yeah, I completely agree in, in that sense. I think, yeah, having a certain place, praying in a certain place, I think for sure make, makes, makes a certain difference. Um, be, I think it'd be interesting to also speak about what you do with, with March for Life UK. Uh, so I believe you're the, the director of that. Um, maybe could you like, say a bit about what, they, what you do and um, its significance for the, the pro-life movement? Yeah, so um, March for Life, um, one of the things that a lot of people know about March for Life is we have a big march in, in London. Yeah. Um, this year in 2023, it's happening on the 2nd of September in, in London again. Yeah. Um, so that's a, an opportunity to come and, and witness to the value of life. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just to make that clear, that isn't a protest. We, we go there um, as a public witness um, to recognise the, the value of each and every life in the moment of conception and also the damage that abortion inflicts on mm. women. Um, so, yeah, check out the website. People can do that, marchforlife.co.uk and find out more about the march. But throughout the year, there's lots of other events that we have coming up. Um, and it's definitely worth looking on our website to see we've got um, a, a, a day called Rethink Abortion, which is coming up at the beginning of February. Mm. Um, if, if anyone was interested in that, um, we often mark the anniversary of the Abortion Act or the passing of the Abortion Act. Mm. Um, we have public witness events. Um, so a lot of our events would be designed to create awareness of the hurt and damage abortion causes and, mm. and to promote the dignity of life from conception. Also to create that sort of spirit of community within mm. the pro-life movement that I think is, is really needed, whether that's nationally or, or in own, people's own individual areas. Mm. Um, and also to encourage people who maybe are inclined to sort of um, label themselves as being pro-life, but mm. without actually doing anything about that. Mm. And I think it's maybe important to help people find ways they can move to the ne next step mm. and be actively pro-life rather than just having that as, as a sort of tag that they call themselves. So we also try and help people find the ways to actively be pro-life in, in their own communities. Yeah, so it'd be interesting to, to uh, lead on from that about how some people may label themselves as pro-life. Um, but in, in addition to March for Life, what, sort, what do you think the best approach for people who are pro-life to be in their society is like, should they be more outspoken about it or should they more quietly go about their life? How best can they advocate it? It's a good question. And I think we've always got to find that balance between truth and love. You know, if we're speaking in truth, we have to speak lovingly. If we're speaking lovingly, it has to also be something truthful. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think whatever actions, whatever words we speak, we, we need, always need to think, are they truthful? Are they loving? As to what people do maybe more specifically, that obviously will depend on their own circumstances, you know, whether they're, they're somebody with a, with a family, whether they're, um, you know, somebody, a, a, a younger person, whether they're somebody who's maybe housebound, or obviously our own um, circumstances might dictate what we can and can't do. Mm. On, on our website, um, the, the March for Life website, we have a list of all the different pro-life organisations. Wow. So people can go there and maybe see, like, this is where I think my talents might mm. lie, you know. Um, maybe I'm somebody who, who would like to get more involved in politics. Maybe I'm somebody who would like to go into schools and, and teach people there. Yeah. Maybe I'm somebody who'd like to help people who've been hurt by abortion. Or um, maybe I'd like to organise a coffee morning in my yeah. own church, whatever it might be. And sometimes it can just be taking that very first initial step. We don't have to start with a massive plan. We aren't all called to speak to yeah. hundreds of people. But how can I minister to maybe those few people or that one person that I might know who, who mm. might need ministering to or encouraging in, in whatever way that might be. And it is good to set ourselves those goals, I think, rather than mm. just thinking, I'll wait for somebody to say something to me, and rather, you know, being too passive about it. Sometimes we have to be the one to, to gently and lovingly take that first step mm. to either bring up that topic or to help, um, you know, guide somebody or whatever it might be in our own our own circle that, that, that we work in. So there's definitely something for everyone and everyone can get involved in somehow. Yeah, well, well Isabel, well, thank you for, for speaking with us. Um, it's been it's been great uh, hearing you, you know, what, you've, what you've had to say, really. I'm sure it inspire many people around the world. And um, yeah, thank you for watching this on Shekinah Europe.